so every talk should have a title, I think. And the title that I had at the top of my page as I wrote this talk was Theology in Place. But that feels really boring to me. And I've been thinking about being here in Charlotte, what it would feel like, what would the energy be, how would we be with each other, and would we have place with one another? And so now that we are here, how does it feel to be with one another? What is the energy with one another? Do we have place with one another? So as I got to the middle of my talk, writing it, I had this phrase that kept running through my head, which was the poetics of place. The poetics of place. So if this talk needs a title, which I think it does, it should be that, the poetics of place. And poetics is both rhythmic, narrative, and constructive. What are the rhythms of this place that we are curating together. We heard some of it this morning. If you if you looking for where I've gone, I'll be threading. That's the place. Where do we feel the energetic folds of becoming? Do we feel what is becoming? Can we imagine the poetics of place? Can we feel the threads of the stories that we are weaving together? Can you even imagine weaving together a vision of place? Story is, I think, still the thing that moves us and compels us to think and act differently. My work over the last 10 years has been to create story in compelling ways by helping folks think theologically. I like to think of my work as a weaver. Weaving together stories and theories that help people connect the dots to live their politics. Because I do not care what you believe. I care about your politics. About two and a half years ago, I talked a little bit about this on Tuesday. I moved back home to the South. The 2016 presidential election prompted my move home to land I know and a culture that I had missed. Having left Texas in my mid-20s for the big city of Chicago for seminary, I had come to my queerness and transness and that awareness in deeply secular ways. I cut my teeth on radical queer politics. I needed the break because my participation in faith communities meant harm for my body, mind, spirit. And returning home to the South several years ago was more than just a return home to land. It was a return home to people and a spirituality that had deeply shaped me as a young person. And I talked a little bit about that with Rachel on Tuesday. This place to which I was returning and am continuing to, to return is not without complications. I assure you that. I mean, I left the Bay Area for a red state. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but moving home to the South in the body that, that I have meant that I needed to think carefully about place. My body is marked in certain ways and is a target in other ways. Not only is my body marked with tattoos, which is a restoring of my own becoming, but my body is marked as transgender and also white passing. My body is a target when I'm in places that are transphobic or indifferent to my radical difference. I am a borderland being. We live in the midst of borderlands, places that are riddled with complexities and change. We ourselves are sites of becoming. We are borderland beings. That is our place. Can you feel and sense the rootedness of the place of becoming? The South has various borderlands, and we negotiate both urban and rural borderlands here in the South. We heard a little bit about the Crescent here in Charlotte. How do we create the kind of place for all to be whole? What does it mean to encourage the deepest, most radical flourishing in a place that is permeable, thin in places, and in stark contrast to our politics? The South is a place of becoming. We are people who are becoming. We are searching for wholeness just as many other people are searching for their own wholeness. We are searching for our collective poetics of place. 
Are we yet sheltered in the place of becoming? We are never real theologians, but near to being ones who live a life of theopoetics. And our emotion is nothing but an expression of a poetics that was lost. So how do we find the poetics of place from the place of being lost? How do we create a theology of place from the place of wholeness? From the fractured places of our becoming? When I think about doing theology, I think first about experience. Where am I? What am I doing? Who is with me? Theology is an event of meaning making and living our values. Theology is also located in time and space. And it also has a geography to it, meaning theology is connected to place. Theology must always have place in mind because place determines context. And Peter talked about this yesterday. When we fail to name the context of an event or when we make meaning, we fail to contextualize meaning making. And meaning making is the work that many of us do as we tell the stories that motivate us and compel us. When I first began studying theology, it was at a Baptist university in West Texas. Those are my roots. I learned every bit of dogma there was to learn. And because I knew I was queer and was also gender nonconforming, that was before I had the language of transgender or non-binary, didn't even exist in 1994. The meaning and context was always against me in that particular place, not affirming me. The place of this theology was not hospitable to the differences I brought to the table. So as we gather here in Charlotte where differences proliferate, where gentrification runs rampant, maybe in your own communities at home, where trans women of color are not safe, where, where white toxic masculinity rules the roost, we know that we must curate in very particular ways. How do we create a place that doesn't exacerbate our paralysis of not knowing how to do it all? How do we trust black women and join in the work of social healing? How do we build the kind of world we want to inhabit when everything around us tells us to not take that leap of faith that might actually transform the world? Place. It matters. And where we put our bodies matter. How we theologize matters. Where is the poetics of place in our theologies? Do we have access to the stories of place? Do we have capacity in this very moment to imagine the place we want to create? Where do we put our bodies? Do we rely on normative scripts to direct our bodies or do we lean into the stories that make us feel just a little bit uncomfortable that might create an opening for poetics of place to emerge? The poetics of place needs to reconcile with the already present power that is embodied. We each hold power in our bodies and this holding creates place of power and what we do with this power will dictate how we shape and shift place. Where are the fractals, the bubbling brooks that show us a new way? Where are the places that help us feel into the work that is left undone? Place. While it matters, it also has history. What are the stories we are telling about the places that we occupy? Are we whitewashing these places or letting their roots speak the truest truths? Are we connecting to the roots of our stories? Are those roots connected to place? For many of us, we are disconnected from our roots and therefore disconnected from place. How do we recover that which is lost? What place protects the dreamer? What place creates conditions to dream. What place helps further intimacies? What places are political? When we refuse to live our politics, we excise our values from the story of our lived experience, and we replace the virtue of belonging 
with the dominant form of living, which is rooted in the current maelstrom of a white neoliberal capitalist supremacy. This is not place. This is not place. This is not a good use of our embodied power. This does not create conditions to dream. Let me be real with you. We cannot step beyond the everyday. The everyday is our place of becoming. If we are paralyzed by the everyday, then we are burdened by the culture that fuels consumerism and commodity. When we unburden ourselves from this paralysis and actually imagine the kind of place we want to curate, we step into the everyday in new and meaningful ways. This is culture shift. And the kind of culture shift we need to create conditions for power, belonging, worth, and agency to be the pulse, the vital pulse of our becoming. We cannot take a step in our own becoming if we think that it is mere illusion. We have to believe we are creating something for our moment, not holding on to the past or reaching for the fiction of the future. We have to be present with the now, with what is becoming, with our everyday place. There is no escape from the now, from what is becoming. I am asked repeatedly if I am a Christian. What does it mean to be Christian in this present now? Do you know? Really, do you know? Christianity equals white supremacy in this present now. And the fictional future doesn't look all that good. We've got to wrestle with the now, lean into the becoming of what it is, root ourselves in place that doesn't obscure the now, but seeks to compost and transform what has been in order to transform the now into an everyday where we each have capacity to participate in the folds of becoming. There is no escape from the now, but if we root ourselves in the storing of possible futures, we have a chance to become all we are called to be. What is the place that is calling you? What is the place that is calling you? Where do you sense, sense and feel that in your body? In the matter that is your vital pulse. What is your dream? Where do you sense and feel that in your body? What places connect you to them and them to you? What root systems are thirsting for your nourishment? If what you've heard is that place is shifting and unstable, that is right. You are hearing correctly. What we've done is try to cement our faith and theology into a place that can't fit all of who we are. So, what borderlands are calling you? What places of becoming are beckoning you? What territories are you willing to divest from in favor for borders and territories and terrain that shift our politics to be the kind of values we need to live? As a non-binary, transgender, Latinx, my entire world is shifting as I am seeking to return home to the South. I had to take a leap of faith in order to be faithful in the small things. Sometimes that leap of faith is on Sundays when I take my testosterone shot, imagining the body that is becoming. And other times, it's accepting invitations like this one. To come and be with the with collective, the cloth from which I'm cut, and saying yes when I have no clear vision for what it will become. We must be here for the becoming. If we are simply being, we will miss the present now. So, what is the place that is calling you? What becoming is closest to your breath right now? We can't escape the everyday. Now is our time to participate 
in becoming the kind of people we are called to become. May it be so. So we're going to take a few minutes for q and i I'm going to drink my coffee while we do that. And then I'm going to jet. I'm going to leave. <laughs> so ask your questions now. I'm easy to find online. I'm happy to correspond with folks. Um, but where are you with all that has been said and all that has been sung? Are you threading the needle of the idea of place? Weaving has never been my strong suit. I tried to do it in Mexico when I was there, and I just can't get it. I'm not, I'm not a weaver, but I like the idea of weaving together stories. I feel like the thread is, is being unraveled in preparation to be reformed and transformed. Yeah. And my ideas of place, ideas of what it means to be strengthening ways that I have never thought about. Mm -hmm. It's more like deconstructing. We never thought we should reconstruct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I thought we'd be able to hear you everywhere, but we can't. So I just, now I'm going to put you on a mic if you want. So this is the mic person. So if you have a question, allow the mic to get to you because we can't hear everything that people are saying. Can you just summarize what you question. said? I know, but. I was, I was just saying that um, I feel like instead of threads coming together into something, it feels like there, there's a deconstruction. They're being pulled apart, and I'm able to see threads that I hadn't, or see elements of the tapestry that I hadn't noticed before. Um, and the challenge now is taking this idea of place and actually creating uh, a tapestry that I'd like to, to use and drape over me at some point. Yeah. Great. Other ideas? Yep. Right here. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was kind of thinking about this um, coming out of my background from conservative, conservative fundamentalism. Um, stepping into, at the time, a church that was on the journey to become affirming. Um, and I think, uh, as a queer person, um, the, it's almost like there's LGB and then there's the T part of our community. Um, so what would, I guess, sort of be your thoughts on things that we need to be mindful of as faith communities and in inviting uh, trans people, trans women of color, trans men of color into these communities where, where often there's this deep, deep emotional trauma, not just from their family, prior faith expressions, but also from uh, the queer community in which they're supposed to belong to. Well, you know, there's been a long history of um, the T has always been contested in in lesbian and gay space, right? And so, uh, if it's if it's if it's that in culture, it is it is magnified in faith communities even more, right? And and I think that um, we have inherited theologies and ethics that don't support the T. And certainly don't, and, and, if, and if it does support the T, then it's a particular kind of transgender person that, that it supports. And there's certainly not the visibility of non-binary trans people present in our faith communities. And, and there's work trying to be done to, to, to uncover what has been covered, right? But some of it is uh, reckoning with what we've inherited theologically. And culturally, um, how do how do we? 
well, two questions. What have we inherited in the midst of ourselves being disinherited in community? So many of us have been searching for place for years. And we, might, and we might find a place that like fits some aspects of what we need, but then there are gross oversights for other things, right? And I think this is an example of, of that. Um, I like to talk about this, and I talked a little bit about it on Tuesday, about bridging with radical difference. How do we actually build a community of radical difference? This is not just about bridging red and blue or Republican and Democrat. It's not about that because those are two sides of the same coin. This is about how do we actually bring radical difference into this place and curate the kind of place from the place of difference. Difference philosophically means there is no norm. So how do we create a place with no norm? That might feel very anxiety producing for people. <laughs> Because, because as the dominant culture, white folks, are tied to these norms and scripts that tell us what to do and how to act and we can, we can assume and expect to act a certain way. We can be nice because it's the respectful thing to do and then we get the politics of respectability. But how do we actually create something without any norms? That, that is what I think we need to try to curate is a place with no norm and let people be and become. And if we, if we don't allow for the shifting, then we remain paralyzed by the norm because the norm will always keep a boot on our neck in, in whatever capacity. Does that help? Right here. Thanks. Um, thanks, Robin. Thank you for this whole yeah. piece. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions that I, 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 I are just knocking around. One is, and it's something that Tommy and I think are going to get into a little bit this afternoon, but the, the essential um, uh, message of the Christian faith is, it, it feels to me anyway, is that there's metanoia. There's change that's always happening, right? right? And in creating these holding tanks where change can take place. And, and what does that look like when you tolerate the intolerable for some? You know, the, an opinion that is so far out of the norm that you don't want to at all say that opinion is okay, right? Yeah. And yet making change, creating some sort of holding tank where people are uh, rep repent, I mean, yeah. to use the old word metanoia, yeah. right? Um, so that, that's just one thing. How does that happen um, and create that kind of safety and space mm -hmm. for that to happen? Um, people of all sorts of different understandings or proclivities coming in and being something different. And then secondly, and I think this really bears to what we're talking about this afternoon a little bit, how does change happen in, in your framework or in your opinion uh, when we've got this uh, online world that has a non-ending memory to it? Mm -hmm. You know, where I am defined by him, by something that I posted 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I've changed. I'm not that person anymore. <laughs> but that could be drug up and, and kind of used as weapon or weaponized, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so just, I, I know that those are kind of disparate things, but I'm curious how you, how you enter that space. Churches is a place for metanoia, and, yep. and you know, the whole root of trans, right? right? Means to change, transfer, transmit, right? So, yep. yeah, I'm just curious how you'd answer that. I mean, that. I think they're related. I hear them related, and I think a, a base, sort of a starting point would be relationship. We live in a world of deep transactions. Yeah. Everything is transactional. We actually don't know how to be in relationship with one another. I, I say this as often as I can. If, if we don't learn to be human with one another, we will fail at this project. And metanoia, you know, we, we could trace this throughout the New Testament. Um, there are so many examples of metanoia. When Jesus goes and calls uh, the disciples, is gathering disciples, you know, come, follow me, I'll, I will make you fisher of people, we see a change. 
in their action. And we see this all throughout the New Testament, right? But repentance is, I think, not the, it might be the point of departure, but the sort of thread or the plumb line, I think, of the Christian faith um, is this idea of communion and being with one another, with unity, if you want to break down the word. And we actually don't know how to do that. And part of that is because of our relationality and the ways that we've been socialized by hyper-individualism in, in, in white culture, um, oppositional politics, us against them. Um, social media certainly is about transaction. And you see the oppositional politics that are on social media and, and the fighting and the, and the infighting. And that's actually not a being with people. It's actually a being against people. And so I'm all for metanoia. My, 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 leaving the, my leaving my faculty post and moving home to the South was, was in part a metanoia. It was a return home to my roots. But it, but it can't be only that if I'm not in relationship. And I think that if, if we only think that it's a metanoia from this like self to transcendent, we, have, we are missing it. Because it's about a with union. And if we don't know how to gather at the table with one another, in my ethics classes, I do, I do this um, project about, so we're planting a church and a sexual predator wants to come and join our church. How, how, how do we welcome them? Do we? What, what are the boundaries? If we're going to be a community of radical difference, if we're going to be God's people, how do we actually create a, a space for transformation, for healing? And my students are, you know, they're, it's split. It's like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And then other people are like, well, actually. And I, I think this is where we are. And we could use all sorts of examples. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer wants to come to our church. The Unabomber wants to come to our church. How do we actually be with people who may have that opinion that we think is sinful, that we think is against God and against our people? How do we actually be with people? And that's the root question. How do we be with people? And I don't think we have a clear answer. We don't have a collective answer on that one. Thank you. I'm, I'm digging everything I'm hearing, by the way. Um, I, I really want to, if possible, if you could expound on the concept of um, not having a normal. I think uh, the more I'm hearing these ideas of place, there's concepts of familiarity, safety, belonging, um, stability, mm -hmm. and then to say that we are to coexist in a place where there is no normal, then what aspects become um, safe, mm -hmm. familiar, uh, stable? Mm -hmm. um, I totally agree that concepts of normal as we currently understand it are limiting and more harmful, um, but how do we establish the, the duality of that? I mean, I, this is gonna sound trite, but I think it's through relationship, right? Like when we are relational, when we are actually with one another, and, and I'm talking about deep solidarity. Um, I, I, I wanna share a story um, about one of my kinfolk who who lives in New York City, he's a, he's a gay white male, who is deeply entangled with me. And, and the norm that we have is radical honesty. And so when I say that there should be no norms, what I mean is the scripts that actually drive the culture. We can have a way of being with one another, which might feel like a norm, but the normative is a thing that has created a supremacy culture that needs to be transformed and composted into the beloved community. And we, and we don't yet know how to do that. So, so while all of my answers seem to point to relationship, I, I believe that is true. We can even see that... Um, up until the very end when Jesus was crucified, everything about how he moved in the world was relational. 
outfoxing the empire was relational. Having a last supper was relational. Being on the cross was relational. And we don't yet know how, we're, we're so tied to dogma and belief. We, we're not connected to our politics and our lived experience in, in a way that will, will really transform the world. That is the power of this with collective, I think, is this chance to actually create a way of being in the world, which is deeply relational. The, the whole time that, that, that these folks have been planning, there's been so much communication and a deep invitation to be with them. And I'm like, that is amazing because that's not always my experience. Mostly my experience is transactional. Come and give a talk. We'll give you your check. We'll take you to the airport. That is not what this has been. This has been come and be with us, share your gifts, get to know our people. Mark this morning says, do you trust the crowd? I'm like, yes. (laughs) Why? Because there's been so much groundwork, relational groundwork from David, from the invitation back in the spring to Jen being in communication and the the deep posture of welcome. And that that is transformational. And that the root of that has been relational. And I, I can't say enough about that because our churches are actually not like that or not like this, not like my experience. Does that help? Great. Do you have time for one more? Yes. Okay. I have 10 minutes. Uh, thanks, Robin. Yeah. You, you gave me a really important image at this point in my life um, when you said, um, you know, what boundary is your body pulling you toward? Mm-hmm. Or, so that, was that in the range of? Yeah. Stuff? Okay. Um, that's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> it's important. So, um, but that was really helpful for me because um, I'm, uh, I am a white, cisgender, straight male um, who's 65 and 40 years in ministry. And where my body has been pulling me the last two years, the boundary, and I wasn't using that language, the boundary that God's been pulling me toward is out of the center. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, working with our church this uh, in July, I, um, and I absolutely love my job, but I am semi-retiring to 25% because we have to, my place needs to be filled by somebody who doesn't look like me or isn't like me. Right. And it's been two years of, of grieving. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a lot of loss because I'm finally, I'm finally in a church that I adore and I love. And it's 10 years old now, and it's just, it's time for me uh, to make room. But I just want to say, with that language, I, I'm not going to uh, scoot to the edge in shame because I'm a white, cisgender, straight male. But that's the way Jesus is. Uh, it, it feels good. Mm-hmm. It's a leading. Um, and I will refer to your language when I, because there are times I just feel the shame. There's times I feel profound loss. Um, because, <laughs> you know, I, I love preaching, but I don't need to keep doing that. Yeah. I need to listen more. So anyways, thanks for yeah. the language that my body needed to hear. Mm. That's important. Yeah. So this, I I appreciate the question and response. I don't know if there's necessarily an answer to this right now, and I don't necessarily want an answer. I more want, this is a space that I've been trying to, like, wrestle with and moving into, and I want everyone to be thinking about this. Um, I find that I'm... The, the generation that's coming um, behind us is so far ahead of us. And that is something that I find really encouraging. And holding kind of that in-between space where being an adult, working with youth that are figuring these things out, that are ahead of me, like how do we hold that space to learn from them while still holding ourselves responsible and accountable for the values that we raise them into? Like the values that we hold so we're not creating shame around these new ideas that they are teaching us, 
but also still, like you talk about, um, like people coming in with, say, different proclivities, I think is the word that was used, that might challenge our values. How do we hold space for that when we're moving into these transitional spaces where when I was growing up, like my identity was considered a problematic proclivity? So what things are we holding on to that the youth might be teaching us are not the problems that we thought they are while still holding ourselves accountable for what we expose the youth to or allow them to engage in? Do you want me to respond? I mean, I feel like that was, I mean, I feel like that doesn't need a response. You know, I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. I ask myself that all the time. I'm like, I think I'm so progressive and open-minded. I'm like, what are my kids gonna do that's gonna just really throw me for a loop? Yeah. You know, what are yeah. they seeing that yeah. I'm not seeing yet? So, yeah. so I keep thinking about this word permeability, and I'm wondering if you could expand on it for me more, especially because I'm as you asked those just really lovely poetic questions that washed over all of us and were really helpful, thank you, but also really challenging. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna need a few weeks to sort of start to figure some of it out. Yeah. But I think particularly I'm hoping that you'll define it in a way that will help me make some sense out of when you're longing for a place in your past that you want to go back to. Mm -hmm. What are you supposed to do with it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I first want to respond to the emotion of that question, which is um, loss and grief is hard. And as a five on the Enneagram, I know how to compartmentalize. And um, Which is not helpful because it means that it means that I'm just now beginning to grieve the fact that um, I don't have people and I don't have a place, right? And that I assimilated into academia um, because a white gay man, and I shared this on Tuesday, a white gay man said I have an allergy to myself, right? That... Um, that you know, that goes to the very core of, like, your people saying that you don't belong here. And so, um, you know, I yearn, I yearn to have belonging. And, and the, and I think I expect to have a place of belonging. But the reality is, is that, um, the grief and loss is so great that I don't even know how to imagine place. So that's that piece. The permeability piece, the porosity piece is in my, in my doctoral program, I did some work around um, flesh and skin and the permeability of who we are. And we forget that we are porous beings. We're sponges, really. And we have created a society where we function as if we are barrier people. Like we're all wearing like condoms on ourselves. <laughs> and, what I, and what I mean by that is that we actually don't, we, we, we don't know how to get in with one another. We don't know how to um, entangle ourselves, weave ourselves together with the pores of, you, of who you are. And that's a relational thing. We've, we've created a, rela a relationality that is, um, it doesn't support being permeable. We can talk about intent and impact all the time, and yes, we are impacted by people, but we actually don't know how to be in relationship with people to really impact and transform one another, which is why we have structural injustices racial injustices, et cetera. And so this permeability thing, this borderland place, is we are surrounded by borderlands. Psychic, sexual, um, 
material, um, state, nation, county, land. I mean, we are, we are completely surrounded by borderlands and those borderlands are permeable. They are not fixed. They are always shifting. And if we capitulate to uh, this paralysis of white normativity, which is, which is like root supremacy culture, then we miss out on being permeable people that can really transform and change one another and our culture. And so I think being a people of permeability and really living into a permaculture is the, is the road to transformation. But again, this goes back to like 20 minutes ago, we don't know how to be with each other. So, is that helpful? I gotta go, y'all. <laughs>